My hair looks kind of weird today, but honestly, it is what it is. Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Kylie, if this is your first time here, and today... We're talking about Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. The Goblet of Fire came out in 2005 and it received an 88% on Rotten Tomatoes. Harry Potter finds himself competing in a hazardous tournament between rival schools of magic, but he is distracted by recurring nightmares. Also, yes, I am wearing my Gryffindor robe today. I've been trying to sport all my Harry Potter related stuff in all of these videos. But anyways, if you're new, I do always get into a bunch of fun facts about the movie, then I give my spoiler-free thoughts, and then I get into my spoiler-filled breakdown. We have yet another new director for this movie, his name is Mike Newell. He decided against the studio's original idea to break this book up into two movies. They originally wanted to do this because this was the longest book at the time, and it was actually the director of the previous movie, Alfonso Cuaron, that convinced him to do this, because it was also the opinion of Newell that there was enough from the book that they could cut out to just turn it into one movie. Also, sadly, Cuaron was offered to direct this installment of the franchise, but he had to turn it down because he was still working on post-production from The Prisoner of Azkaban. So upsetting. <laughs> because if you weren't here last week, I was praising Quaron to no end for all of his stylistic choices in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and how I just think it's such a shame that that was the only one that he directed, but nonetheless, moving on. Henry Cavill, who we now know most popularly as Superman, auditioned for the role of Cedric Diggory. But as we know, a young Robert Pattinson starred as Diggory, and this was his theatrical movie debut. He has also stated that he would much rather play Cedric Diggory again than ever play Edward Cullen again. <laughs> Rosamund Pike was the first choice for the character of Rita Skeeter, but she turned it down. The underwater scenes in this movie were shot in a huge purpose-built tank with a blue screen background. Safety divers swam in between tanks with scuba regulators to allow the actors and actresses to breathe without having to surface. Daniel Radcliffe alone logged around 41 hours and 38 minutes underwater during the course of filming. Also at one point during training, he inadvertently signaled to the divers that he was drowning and so they had to panic bring him up to the surface. Radcliffe also unfortunately suffered two ear infections after after shooting all of the underwater scenes. Brendan Gleeson had to wear a wig when he was portraying Mad-Eye Moody to conceal all of the mechanics of his magical eyeball. Most of the kids had around three weeks to prep for the dancing in the Yule Ball scenes. However, because Daniel Radcliffe appears in almost every scene of the movie and he was constantly working, he only had about four days to prepare for that scene. He has mentioned in interviews that that's the reason why most of the shots of him dancing are filmed from the waist up so that it wouldn't show his feet fumbling around. But luckily this is not a big issue because Harry is not supposed to be a good dancer, so it worked out. Director Mike Newell staged a brawl with one of the Weasley twins, both to demonstrate what he wanted from the scene with the two of them, but also to undermine his own authority figure status. Apparently he didn't like that they called him Sir, so I guess he kind of just wanted to be one of the boys. But in doing so, he accidentally fractured a rib. <laughs> Apparently Icelandic moviegoers cracked up the first time that Rita Skeeter said her name, because the pronunciation of her last name, Skeeter, which with the British accent accent is like Rita Skeeta, and Skeeta is an Icelandic verb which happens to be a rather crude word for defecating. So it's basically the translation of shit. Over 3,000 girls auditioned for the role of Cho Chang, and Cho Chang also happens to be one of the most hated characters. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone at this point, I think this has kind of been a hot topic on the internet for the past couple of years, but Cho Chang is kind of a racist character. A reporter named Kimmy Yam wrote, I love how Cho Chang is trending, JK Rowling gave the one Chinese character the name equivalent of Ching Chong. Then that character ended up being a snitching ass square and did literally nothing in the series but date people. And that's totally true and totally valid. JK Rowling didn't do any research in terms of like Chinese names. She also didn't bother to give her a personality or anything, which I just find ridiculous because she's so brilliant. She has this entire universe created in her head with hundreds of characters. And yet the first love interest of Harry has the personality of a fluorescent light bulb. I don't even, okay, I just pulled that one out of my ass. I'm looking at my lights right now and that's just what came to mind. But for my last fun fact, Cho Chang became Scottish once Katie Leung was cast so that she could just use her natural accent. And because David Tennant is also Scottish, Barty Crouch Jr. became Scottish then as well. Okay, so I'm gonna get into my spoiler-free thoughts right now and I'm just briefly gonna kind of touch on Mike Newell's direction. But I'm not gonna go too into detail because this is obviously my spoiler-free section and also there is just so much canon from the book that got left out. It would take way way too long to cover all of that, but I will say that some scenes from the book are recreated in excruciating detail, like perfectly, and then others strayed 
super far from the canon. So the direction was just a little bit weird in this movie. I think that for the most part, Mike Newell adapted the book pretty well. The things that he cut out, I'm fine with. Except one thing is that Sirius Black, who was a huge character in the last movie, is pretty much all but cut out of this movie. He has like one scene. And it also bums me out that Dobby was cut out of this movie, but I completely understand because his subplot was just super inconsequential. So for the most part, I do understand. I think that Mike Newell, in terms of adaptation, did a decent job. Some scenes in the book are far more interesting, but also due to time and budget constraints, there were just some things that they simply could not do. As far as the more artistic vision of this movie, though, I think it really lacks in cinematography. Whereas in With the Prisoner of Azkaban, I just found myself gasping. I was like, wow, this movie looks so great. In this movie, we kind of dial that back. The shots look a lot more flat. The colors are kind of more saturated again, which is fine. It's just, I think that there is a way to make Harry Potter movies so brilliant and visually pleasing. And it just bums me out that some directors didn't really take advantage of that. But anyway, so getting on to sort of the general themes of this movie. So this story takes us slightly out of the scope of just the school, which I think is awesome. Now we're introduced to the world of Quidditch. They get to go to the Quidditch World Cup. We're introduced to foreign wizarding schools. We also get some really cool new sets with all the events of the Triwizard Tournament. And like I was mentioning earlier, there is some really cool underwater stuff. And the tournament and these new sets and stuff, it just gives this movie a very grand, a very majestic feeling to it. However, my one gripe with this is they didn't quite go hard enough. All the focus is obviously still on Harry, that's fine. But then when they introduce the students of the other schools, they just look like complete monoliths, like just groupings of the exact same person that have been replicated. Like Durmstrang, strong boy. And the Beaubaton girls, pretty blonde. <sighs> In the book, I'm pretty sure that each school was unisex also, but whatever. There's just so much from the books that they had to pack into these movies that apparently those were the choices that had to be made. Maybe so that there would be less visual noise, maybe there would be too much individuality if they didn't make all the students from the other schools look the same, I don't know. I just think it's kind of boring because like in a world of super quirky, crazy characters, why do all the students from this particular school look the same? Theatrically, obviously it made sense because they were making a very grand and entrance and they wanted to look good and you know, that makes sense. It's, I don't know, I just, I don't really find it that interesting, I guess. Moving on though, the score of this movie is also just moi. I don't know how I've gone this long without mentioning the score of these movies, but in literally every Harry Potter movie, they know what they're doing. It's also not a mystery why they're so good because the first three movies were composed by John Williams. I'm not sure if he went on to do any of the other ones. He didn't compose this one though. The amount of unforgettable and just downright brilliant score that John Williams has composed is kind of hard to wrap your head around because music is such an emotional and important part of a movie and can you just sort of imagine what Hollywood would be like without John Williams? Hollywood movies like E.T., Star Wars, Harry Potter. Did he do Indiana Jones? I can't remember. Oh my God, he did Home Alone, Jurassic Park, all of the Star Wars movies. And I guess he only did a couple Disney movies. I was under the impression that he did more. Anyways, so okay, he didn't even compose the music for this movie, so I'm gonna move on, but the music in this movie, still drawn from John Williams, still brilliant. Anyways, I am gonna wrap up my spoiler-free thoughts pretty soon here because I just don't have a whole lot to say that doesn't contain spoilers. There's just so much to unpack about the story, the new concepts, the new creatures, the new characters. So I'm just gonna leave it at the fact that I love this movie because I love the Triwizard Tournament. I love all of the events. I still love our characters, obviously. I think it would have been done more justice had Mike Newell not tried to kind of abandon the artistic style that quite on had introduced. But that's kind of a running theme in this franchise that directors try to out-direct the person that came before them, so they try to like put their own spin on it. And I'm just of the opinion that if it's not broke, don't fix it. However, like I said, the story is great and I really don't think that any of the Harry Potter movies could be considered bad. I think they're all amazing. Also at this point, Harry is having his first crush on a girl. He also has quite a bit more near-death experiences in this movie and so you can kind of tell that the kids are definitely starting to grow 
up a lot more. And this was the first Harry Potter movie to be rated at a PG-13, so they're really just starting to up the stakes with this one. So like I say for all my Harry Potter reviews before I get into my spoiler section, I cannot recommend this franchise enough. It is just so fun. And who doesn't love magic, you know what I mean? But I am gonna get on to my spoiler section right now, and so I'm gonna start with some spoiler-filled fun facts. At least one full-scale dragon was constructed on the set, which could even blow real fire. And the dragon was created partially from the basilisk puppet seen in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. In one of the first takes of Hermione's Cinderella moment, she actually tripped on her dress and fell down the stairs. This is the only Harry Potter movie where Hermione doesn't cast a single spell. Stanislav Janeski only utters two lines in the entirety of this movie, and both of those lines combined only consisted of 20 words. This is the only movie to show that Polyjuice Potion can replicate the voice of somebody else because in the Chamber of Secrets it couldn't. They still had their own voices when they turned into Crab and Goyle. Okay, now I'm gonna get into some of the canon that they changed from the book because there is quite a lot of it. I'm, again, not gonna go over all of it. This is the first Harry Potter movie not to feature the Dursleys, but they do appear in the book and the Weasleys even come to visit them when they pick up Harry to go to the Quidditch World Cup. However, because the actors that were portraying the Dursley family demanded more money for this movie, that part was completely omitted. And this is why when we open on Harry, he is at the burrow and he's not with the Dursleys. But honestly, that feels like a natural omission to me anyways. I don't think we really needed to see the Dursleys in this movie. And from what I can remember from the book, they don't offer up really anything that's consequential to the plot. One thing from the book though that I'm so furious that they left out is the bit of the Quidditch World Cup where they actually play. In the book, Harry got these super cool binoculars so he could zoom in on all the players, he could pause them, he could rewind, he could put them in slow motion. I would have loved to have seen the visuals they came up with for those. I think I'm gonna get more into that later though. The elves Dobby and Winky were cut from this movie due to time constraints. However, apparently, if you watch carefully in the first campsite scene right after Ginny points to something and says, look, you can see two house elves riding on llamas, but they go by very fast and so they're hard to see. I've personally never noticed that, but uh, maybe I can find a clip of it. <laughs> Although it's not explained in the movie, Fleur de la Cure is described as part Vila in the book. Vilas in the Potterverse are nymph-like beings with the ability to charm men, and Fleur has a strand of her grandma's Vila hair in her wand. I just thought that was an interesting detail to let you guys know because in the movie, Ron is obviously so vexed by her, but in the movie, she's just a regular degular girl. In the book, they also go into more detail about the subplot with Rita Skeeter because she is an unregistered animagus, she can turn herself into a beetle, and that's how she hears everyone's juicy secrets. Another thing that they cut out of this movie that was from the book was the way that Dumbledore explains to Harry the nature of his and Voldemort's wands, because their wands are brothers and they both contain a feather from the same phoenix, and granted Ollivander did explain that in the first movie, but we were supposed to learn more about it and get a better understanding from Dumbledore in this movie. Also, this next bit from the book provides so much more context for the Order of the Phoenix that I'm just surprised that they left it out, but when they capture Barty Crouch Jr. and the Ministry shows up, a the mentor performs the kiss on him and renders him basically brain dead. And so because he can't testify, the ministry doesn't believe him and Dumbledore when they say that Voldemort has returned. And this is what led to the sort of angry fallout between Dumbledore and the ministry. I just think that would have set us up so much better for the Order of the Phoenix because once you get to the next movie, you're like, why does everybody hate Harry? Like, why does nobody believe him? And finally, the last thing that we did not learn in the movie that we learned in the book has to do with Harry's magical blood. The love protection from his mother's blood is so strong that it even works when Harry is around Aunt Petunia because she also has his mother's blood. So when Petunia is near, Harry is magically protected from danger. And that's the reason why he has to go back to the Dursleys time and time again, despite being offered that he could stay at the burrow or with Sirius, etc. That's kind of a crucial bit of information and I can't remember if they ever bring it up again in the movies. Maybe in like Deathly Hollows part one? Am I mistaken? I don't know. But that does it for the canon that they left out of the book, so now I'm gonna get on to the new characters of this movie. Up first is Victor Crumb, and we obviously didn't really get much from him. I would have loved to see more of a rivalry between him and Ron, but we simply just didn't have time for that. Up next is Fleur Delacour, and she is so 
wasted. And in the book, granted, she didn't have much of a role either. I just think that it's lame that she was so two-dimensional because she was also the only woman to compete in the Triwizard Tournament and she was useless. Go girl, give us nothing. Up next is Cedric Diggory and oh my God, I hate that he dies in this movie. And I wish that we had gotten more from him too because we gather that he's really humble, he's a nice guy, but he has barely any dialogue. I think I just wanted more out of literally every character because they all had so much potential, but they're just wasn't really enough time to explore any of them. But even without knowing him super well, his death is super heart-wrenching nonetheless. Up next is Cho Chang, and I just don't really feel like I'm the one to host this discussion, but she's obviously a problematic character. So I'm not gonna go too into it, and it's also more of an issue in the next movie, so we will get there when the time comes. I just wish we knew why Harry liked her. Why her? Why was he drawn to her? Like, she is beautiful, and he is a young, horny teen, so I get it. It's just that thematic these movies are so deep, so I don't understand why she has no personality. Because when you think of Harry, in my opinion, he would be drawn to someone who's like really brave and cares about love, I don't know. And yes, love is trial and error and high school relationships don't usually mean anything, but we're in a cinematic universe of wizards, okay? So I think she could have had a personality. Up next would be Rita Skeeter. This woman. I think we all hate her and I think it's also a very strange subplot for this movie. And also because this was the longest book in the franchise up until this point, I think it was honestly unnecessarily long. This is one of the subplots that I don't understand why she included. The only function that she really serves is to make Harry mad, make Harry seem less credible, I guess, which does have a tie into the next movie. I just don't find her character really necessary. I don't think that they really needed to bring her in. They could have just shown her column and Harry could have reacted to what he read. I don't think we needed to spend time with her as a character. I do have to say though, she was cast perfectly. I'm not really familiar with the work of Rosamund Pike, so I don't know how she would have handled the role, but I don't think that Rita Skeeter could have been cast any better than she was. Anyways though, moving on to Mad-Eye Moody. So I love Mad-Eye Moody, even though for the most part, he is Barty Crouch Jr. He's admittedly a very bizarre teacher, and he also turns Draco into a ferret at one point, but other than that, he seems seems like a really good, competent teacher. And I just question why, because it doesn't seem to line up with Barty Crouch Jr.'s motives in the slightest. And also on that token, why did he put Mad-Eye Moody in a box? Why did he not kill him? Like he's a follower of Voldemort and he's trying to carry out this scheme, you know? So why not kill one of the most powerful Aurors in the UK? Why keep him alive in a box? I don't get it. Also, in the whole franchise, we spend the most amount of time with this version of Moody, who is really Barty Crouch Jr. So when I think of Moody, typically my mind goes straight to this Moody, who is really Barty, which is just really weird. And because he had so little impact for the rest of the franchise, he kind of just shows up here and there. I think they honestly should have killed off Mad-Eye Moody in this movie. Or in the book, whatever, both. Of course, we also have Victor Karkaroff and Madame Maxine. They don't really do much, except Madame Maxine is the love interest of Hagrid, which is very interesting. I'm bummed that their subplot fell off, but it was also very unnecessary. That basically does it for all the new characters, so now I'm gonna get on to all the new creatures that they brought in this movie. First up, the dragons, okay? Wow. I love dragons, and when I was little, I even had this book that had a collection of short stories about dragons, and it had this little claw on it that was a lock, and I had this special key to unlock my book. So I was obviously really into the dragons in this movie, although they really only show one of them. And I think that this is an instance where they really took it there. Like, they took it as far as they could go with this whole dragon sequence. I know some people don't really like the changes that they made from the book because in the book the dragon was like guarding her eggs and then the golden egg just happened to be one of them and there also wasn't this extended chase scene around Hogwarts grounds but I really like that chase scene. I love that it's extended. I love that Harry gets his broom and like they're flying all over the grounds. I think it's a lot of fun. Although I think it is horribly stupid and definitely an oversight by some of the most brilliant wizarding teachers in the world that they didn't have any kind of protection between the dragon and the audience or like a protective dome around the arena to keep the dragon from getting out or maybe they could have charmed the chain that broke like this but then we wouldn't have the fun broom dragon chase would we i love what they did i think that they took the concept of a dragon and kind of made it the scariest it could possibly be it is also just kind of grossly unfair that harry got stuck with the only dragon that had this death spike ball at the end of its tail so i guess that the triwizard tournament also just does not care about equity anyways 
now moving on to the second task where we learn of the mermaids and the weird squid things. I hate the look of the mermaids in this movie, but it makes sense why they were so gross looking because if they were hot, I think that that would have been a problem with them coexisting next to Hogwarts. I just don't think that anyone would get anything done because all the boys would be trying to talk to the mermaids all the time, you get it. Their voices are also awful. I hate the way that she kind of whisper yells to Harry. Only one. Cause normally mermaids are one of my like favorite fantastical creatures, but they really did them dirty in this franchise. Although it is more in keeping with kind of mythical lore of what mermaids used to be described as. Moving on to the next creature that's not really a creature, but I call him a creature and that would have to be Shark Crumb. I know this doesn't count, but I had to throw it in here because oh my God, I hate it. Look at that, that's awful. It's a terrible thing to behold. I hope I'm not in the minority with that. I hope that I'm not alone in thinking that that is so weird and uncomfortable to look at. But that does it for the new creatures in this movie, unfortunately, so I'm gonna move on to the new concepts that we got in this movie. Port keys. How fun. It's like apparating, but for beginners, it's really cute. And the visualization of it in this movie with the special effects is kind of exactly how I envisioned it in my head, so I loved it. And the port key took them to the next new concept, which is Quidditch World Cups. I think it's such a criminally underrated sequence because now we are expanding the wizarding world into pro sports. I think we need a Quidditch spin-off show, like a show that's just dedicated to Quidditch players and watching them play Quidditch. Why is that not a thing yet? You know what? But I just saw a rumor recently that turned out to be false that HBO was creating a Harry Potter remake for a TV show, which I'm just gonna say right now, I will never support a Harry Potter remake because these movies were so perfectly cast the first time around. And I don't think that anyone would really watch that show. Like maybe a lot of people would try to and they would get high numbers on the first episode, but I don't think that a remake would ever be done justice for this franchise. I don't think that there's any point to it because the wizarding universe is so big. There are so many opportunities for spinoffs. That's definitely a long, winded tangent for another day. Up next is Gillyweed, a very weird concept, but I'm so glad that we got to spend time underwater in this franchise because I've mentioned before how basically every one of the first four movies, I would say, gives us something that we dream of when we think of a magical universe. In this movie in particular, we got what if we could breathe underwater and what if we had to fight a dragon and what if hedges were evil? I always thought the look of Harry after he ate the Gillyweed was kind of gross though. I hate the way that his gills look and his flappy thin hands and feet. So not really a big fan of the aesthetics of Gillyweed, but I think it's a really cool concept. Now we have a new category for today because typically I cover all new characters, creatures, and concepts. And today I am bringing in a new category, which is deaths. Luckily, the only one that we have to talk about today is Cedric, but I do kind of think that he was the perfect first death. I think it really reflected the evil of Voldemort well, because like I mentioned, Cedric was super handsome, super popular, super humble, super nice, and super young. And Voldemort ordered him to be killed without even looking at him. And then he like turned his face over with his dirty foot. It was awful. But I think that it really did set the stage for Voldemort as a villain, especially because he was coming back to his true form. And to be honest though, a lot of deaths in this franchise do make me cry. Cedric is not one of them. And that's kind of why I said earlier, I wish we got a little bit more time with him. In the book we do, when Harry even meets with his parents and he tries to give his parents his winnings from the tournament, like he wants to repay them. And then also in the book, Cedric has a little bit more complicated relationship with his father because his dad really likes to show him off. His dad kind of talks down to Harry and always tries to uplift Cedric and Cedric is like, dad, chill. We got none of that in this movie. I think if we had gotten a little bit more of that, his death could have been a bit more impactful, but as it was, it was a good death. But like I said, he is really the only death of this movie. So now I'm gonna get into my plot breakdown. Hi, um, I realized that I forgot to talk about Frank. Frank? Was that his name? The guy that died during Harry's dream in the very beginning of the movie, but I don't know Frank. You don't know Frank. His death is just easily forgotten, so I forgot to talk about him when I was recording this. But like, do you care about Frank? I don't- let me know. And I'm not gonna fully get into the plot because there's just a lot going on, so I'm gonna talk about my least favorite moments and my favorite moments, and then we're gonna wrap it up. As for least favorite moments, basically any moment that involves Dumbledore in this movie, I'm not a fan of. I do not like Dumbledore in this movie. Of course, there's the infamous line from the book where 
it's like Dumbledore asked calmly. And it is really infuriating just because not only in that instance, but basically in this entire movie, he's acting so out of character. He's all like riled up and loud and yelling like all the time in this movie, whereas before he'd been so soft-spoken. Another least favorite thing, I think that the maze is boring. It was way better in the book with all the weird monsters that they threw in there and then in the movie they decided to make the hedge kind of come alive. And they did this because of budget constraints. I just think that for it being the climax of the movie, like the most exciting event of the Triwizard Tournament, it's the lamest. Another thing I don't like, I don't like the beef between Harry and Ron. I think it's pointless. I think it wastes time. It's just a very contrived and forced subplot that really adds nothing to the movie. And also their hair. Why does everyone's hair look so bad in this movie? And my last least favorite thing is just Rita Skeeter. Like I mentioned, I don't think her subplot really adds anything either. But she was made to be unlikable, so I'm gonna get on to my favorite stuff now. Like I said with the underwater bits, I love that. I love the production design. I love the world that they created down there. It kind of gives me like ancient Greece, ancient Rome type vibes. And it's also just awesome to know that there's a totally thriving, huge ecosystem of sentient beings literally just chilling next to Hogwarts. I don't know how that's never been a problem for the school or for the mermaids, what with all the rowdy young magical teenagers there, but I digress. I also love Professor Moody and his subplot with him being Barty Crouch. I could never watch the scene of his face changing as a child because it is very gross and it is really prolonged, but nowadays I eat that shit for breakfast. It's so cool. I love the special effects of him like transforming and stuff. It's very gross. And I also already mentioned this, but another one of my favorite scenes is when Harry is having to fight the dragon and having to fly away from it. Now getting on to my favorite, favorite parts of this movie. This is my second favorite part of the movie. I love, love how the other schools arrive to Hogwarts. I truly do not know which one of them is better. You get fairy princess vibes from the flying carriage coming in from the Bobaton Academy. And then you get like pirate lord energy from the ship that's coming up from the Great Lake. I mean the Black Lake. <laughs> and now I'm a little bit confused because is the Black Lake a part of the sea? Otherwise, how did they get, it doesn't matter. So anyways, their entrance is truly one of the most majestic moments of this franchise, but the one that takes the cake in this film is the entrance to the Quidditch World Cup. Oh my God, how cool. Like the tent is so sick, but then we get to the actual Quidditch World Cup and we see this, like the fireworks of this little dancing leprechaun and the other team just comes bursting through that. And then they're like, oh yeah, Crumb. And they have all these signs and they're magical and it's amazing. And the way that Crumb like flies on his broom and he like kicks his leg up, it's awesome. They hype it up so much and I'm so ready to watch that game of Quidditch. And then it cuts immediately to them partying after the game is over. So it's my most favorite moment of the movie while simultaneously being my least favorite moment of the movie. Because in the book, it was so cool. Like I mentioned, Harry got those super cool binoculars. We got to like, you know, hear the points of the game and we really like followed the whole thing. I was so excited to see that in the movie and I just couldn't believe they completely cut it. Like I wish that we got to see his special binoculars and the whole Quidditch match instead of the stupid plot line where Ron is mad at Harry for no reason. And that just, it, it means nothing. They make up like halfway through the movie and everything is great. They also probably could have cut some stuff with Rita Skeeter, didn't care about her. I wanted to see the Quidditch. Oh, another favorite scene definitely has to be the Yule Ball. That's, it's amazing. Ron looks stupid. Hermione looks gorgeous. The dancing is funny. And all these characters got to have these little kind of cameo moments during the Yule Ball. I thought it was super nice. And also the production design, just mwah. But that does it for all of my least favorite and favorite moments in this movie. Next week, I will be covering Order of the Phoenix and I'm really excited because I just rewatched that one and there's, there's so much to unpack. There's so much that I didn't didn't notice about that movie before like as a child or the last time that I rewatched it and now I'm so excited to talk about it. So definitely subscribe if you haven't already because I post three times a week. I also have a vlog channel where I do a lot of daily vlogging. If you want to follow that I'll link that down below as well as all my social media and my Patreon. But I hope that you enjoyed this video and I hope I catch you in the next one. Bye!